Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church. It is absolutely an honor to extend the welcome that began at the door, I'm sure, maybe even outside the door, that you received upon entry um, to this church family, to this congregation, to this house of worship. We've all come off a beautiful and wonderful week of celebrating family and, and all the things we're thankful for, and then we get to be here today and experience a time with God. And I'm excited to welcome you into this place to do just that. We invite both member and visitor alike to experience this time as family together as we see what the Lord has in store for us. Welcome to our church.
Today we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. We will light the candle of hope. Our scripture today is Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Everlasting peace. Here is the message which God gave to Isaiah, son of Amos, about Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest of all, towering above all the hills. Many nations will come streaming to it, and their people will say, Let us go up the hill of the Lord to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk in the paths he has chosen. For the Lord's teaching comes from Jerusalem. From Zion he speaks to his people. He will settle disputes among great nations. They will hammer their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nations will never again go to war, never prepare for battle again. Now descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light which the Lord gives us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are the hope in our chaotic world. This Advent, help us slow down, listen to your voice, and focus on what's really important. We place our hope in you as we prepare our hearts to celebrate this Christmas season. Amen. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Has anybody asked you what you hope to receive for Christmas this year? Somebody ask you that? Yeah, me too. People will ask, they'll say, what do you hope to get for Christmas? Now, I know a lot of times we say, well, it's about Jesus and it's not about what we hope to get for Christmas. But you know what? That might teach us something about Jesus if we think about it. When Jesus came into the world, Jesus was what we call the hope of the world because people had been hoping that one day God would bring salvation, bring hope back to them so they could have that relationship with God. So when Jesus came into the world, he brought hope. So when somebody says, what do you hope to get for Christmas? Maybe it's not just what you hope will be under the tree. Maybe what we can think about is that we hope that in Christmas we will have a better relationship with Jesus. We'll learn something new about him. That we'll be able to celebrate his birth like he would want us to, like he wants us to celebrate his birth. And that we'll understand what real hope is about. Our hope is is in the love that God gives us through Jesus who came at Christmas as a little bitty baby. And he grew up and he taught us how to live and how to treat other people. And he made it possible for us to go to heaven and to live with him. That's a pretty nice hope, don't you think? So maybe not only children, but maybe we as adults should ask the question, what do you hope to get for Christmas? I hope that by the end of my Christmas, I will have thought about Jesus in a different way, that I'll have a closer relationship with him, and that I'll understand just a little bit better what his love means to my life. That's my hope for Christmas. So let's have a prayer together, and then I know you're going to go off with Miss Paula and all the rest of them, and you'll have a good time. That's right. Okay. Let's have a prayer together. Dear Jesus... You have taught us that our hope is in you. 
And that when we talk about hoping for something for Christmas, we do hope that there are nice things under the tree for sure. But we also hope that somehow or another that we'll learn something new about you, that we'll grow in our relationship with you, and that by the end of Christmas that we will love you even more in our hearts. Please bless these boys and girls and may all of the hopes of their Christmas come true in you our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Thank you. I told everyone at 8.30 that the hardest part of my job is having to speak after the music. How fortunate we are and how thankful I am that we have such music and that we have each other as family. And it's my prayer and my hope that this Advent season that begins today will be something that you will take seriously and that will give you the opportunity to grow closer to the Lord in this process. We have our Advent books ready, and you'll see those, there's one here in fact, you'll find these in the vestibule. This is the Advent devotional book, and you can each day read your devotional together, have your prayers together, and it will guide you through the various uh, times of Advent, the themes of Advent, and take us all the way up to the Christmas experience. And so I hope you'll be a part of that. They've been written by people here within our congregation and that's a beautiful gift that's given each year, too. So would you bow with me as we pray and ask the Lord for the hope of your heart? And may part of that be what God gives us in this season of the year as we grow closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Lord, all of us have hopes and dreams. Some of those hopes and dreams come true in the realities of the temporal world. Sometimes it's in a gift under a tree or a game that's won or a, something else that takes place in life or a job that's offered or a possibility that's in place that we have been anticipating or hoping for for a long time. And in those things we see you work and we're grateful to you for that. In other lives, they're hoping for good health. They're hoping for the treatments to work. They're hoping for comfort that comes after grief. They're hoping for a future where it seems pretty bleak. And we pray that you will bless those and give to them their hopes. 
In other lives, they're hoping for their loved ones to come home safely. They're hoping to see individuals over the holiday season. We pray that you will bless them with those graces as well. In our lives, we hope for the day when we can see you face to face. And we hope for our heavenly experience with you when that time comes. And we pray that you will give us confidence in our faith and strength in our belief. And that helps us to realize the hopes that you have for us. Bless, we pray, this time of worship and all of the other things that will be a part of the weeks ahead. May we live in hope and may that hope be that which awakens us with expectation and possibility each day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Lord, at this special time of year and this special season, we thank you for so much for all of your blessings, our friends, our family, our material blessings, uh, the very breath you give us to breathe. We know all these things come from you and from a loving spirit of a loving Father. Help us to retain that thankful spirit and that thankful nature throughout the year and help it to make us a special people and um, people that others want to emulate. And we ask, too, on this first day of Advent that you keep the hope alive in us and that we be willing to share it everywhere with those around us this season, especially to the people who are looking for that and who need a message of hope now. We ask that you bless these tithes and offerings 
and use them to build your kingdom and to further your word in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. This is a wonderful time here at First Baptist Church, and I want to invite you to join us for our keyboards at Christmas on December the 8th, for our night of choirs on December the 15th, and for our Christmas Eve services at 3.30 and 6 p.m. on the 24th. I hope you'll come be a part of it here in beautiful uptown Columbus, Georgia. Join us for these special services at First Baptist Columbus, where we do Christmas by the book. Good morning and welcome to worship with our First Baptist Church family here in beautiful uptown Columbus, Georgia. Thank you for joining us for the worship experience and I hope that this is a good day for you. It's a day when we are beginning our Advent experience. We're heading toward the Christmas joy and the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Your being a part of this means a lot to us. We're aware that you're there. I've seen some of you during this very week. And to get to see you this morning through my heart as we are sharing this time and you're watching the service is a blessing and a privilege and something we don't take for granted. May God bless you. May he allow you to be a part of this service in as real and as personal a way as possible. So know that you have our hearts. If you have prayer requests, let us be a part of that too. Next Sunday evening, we're going to have our Keyboards at Christmas, which is a remarkable experience of music, and I hope that you'll be a part of that. I'm sure that'll be live streamed as well, so that you'll get to see it at home if you can't be here in the sanctuary. So may your, may, may your experience be filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and with God's goodness and His grace. Thank you for being a part of today. You have blessed us. May God bless you.
Thank you. That was beautiful. As we begin the Advent season together, as we think about the themes of Advent, the themes are just there structurally to kind of help us touch base with our own feelings and our spiritual needs as we're heading toward that Christmas experience. And it's a reminder that at this point, that hope was what the people had clung to for generations. Looking for a day when the Messiah would come. Looking for a day when God would fulfill the promise that would bring salvation to His people, released to those who, released to those who had been captive to sin. And so when the people would pray for a Messiah to come, it always reflected the kind of hope that they had, and they always clung to that. And it also redirected their spirit to keep trusting that God was going to do what he promised to do. Well, in the middle of all of that, you have Zechariah and you have Elizabeth in this New Testament passage. And Zechariah was a priest, and he served as one of many hundreds of priests in that day and time. His particular group had been called up to serve at the temple and to serve the people. But Zechariah and Elizabeth had committed themselves to serve the Lord and to do whatever the Lord led them to do. They had given themselves to that purpose. And I can tell you, when you commit to a purpose of being in a priestly kind of role, the commitment that you make is, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do, and the purpose in this is to advance your kingdom and to make your world better according to your vision for that world. That's the point. So you assume that Zechariah and Elizabeth would have felt this way, that they had literally given their lives to it. And the one thing that they wanted in life, though, they had not been granted, and that was to have a child. And they felt totally frustrated with that, but they never gave up on the dream of continuing to do what the Lord had led them to do. And Zechariah faithfully performed his duties. He faithfully was where he should be. But you know in your heart that the prayer that they had prayed all through the years was, O oh Lord, send a Messiah, and O oh Lord, give us a child from a very human, close standpoint. Zechariah probably many times had read the passage from the Psalms in 139, beginning with verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, the light will, come, will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. That passage speaks of the hope that an individual has in the Lord. What seems dark to me, impossible, no chance that this will happen. As it seems to continue to creep in and cover me over, there's always that hope. Because you see light where I can't see it. The psalmist continued, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Again, the psalmist is talking about how God has his purpose and strength and he brings things to pass. Well, the passage for today is from Luke 1, and it begins in verse 3. And it's a long passage, and I'll tell you, it begins in verse 5. I don't know why I said 3, 5. But I'll tell you this the passage is the story, and the story is the message. The passage is the story, and the story is the message. So let's enter into that together and allow this to begin to tell us what the Lord wants us to hear as we're thinking about hope at the beginning of Advent. In the time of Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. See, they had done everything the right way. They're praised for that in this. 
but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense had come, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Zechariah was in a group that was it responsible, it was, it was a rotational thing, they were responsible for serving at the temple. Out of that group would be chosen one particular priest who would be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and perform the most sacred rite of all, and that was to pray the prayer of a forgiveness or pray a prayer of intercession for his people. It was a holy moment, a moment that you only aspired to. Only a handful of people in a generation would ever have this opportunity. And it was such a holy place and such a holy moment that priests themselves would think, oh, if only I could have just that opportunity to go into that place that is so holy, it's the dwelling place of God, and could offer the prayers for my people. It was the aspirational thing for the priests. The way the choices were made as to who would go in was based upon the casting of lots. There were holy dice, so to speak. And when they would be cast, when the number would come up for the particular priest, it was known in their minds and hearts that God had spoken and called that particular priest. So the dice was cast, and it was... It was Zechariah's number that was there. Zechariah was being specifically called by God to come and meet with him in the Holy of Holies and offer prayers for his people. Zechariah had to have been overwhelmed. He had to have been absolutely amazed that this had come to him. So once when he went into that place and began to pray, all of the people were assembled outside. Verse 11, while he was in there, the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense, the very place where Zechariah was to be. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son and you are to give him the name John. Well, here he is praying for the prayers for the people, and yet God has reached back and picked up the prayer he and Elizabeth had been praying all along for a child. So in this high and holy moment, God goes to where Zachariah's heart had been, and he answers that prayer right there. But then God says, let me show you how this prayer is going to impact the people why this is important in this moment and this place. It's not that you'll just have a baby. It's not just any baby. Verse 14. He will be a joy and a delight to you, of course. And many will rejoice because of his birth. We're always happy when a baby comes. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Notice what's happened. It's gone from being, you've always wanted a baby, you're going to have a baby, to saying, and let me tell you, what this child is going to mean. So often, the hopes that we have, the dreams that we have, that are so narrow and so much a part of just who we are, can be used by God to transform a world. So the things that we dream small, God dreams big. The things that we dream in what we think is a minuscule way, a simple way, God is dreaming on a grander scale than anything that we ever could imagine. He says this child is going to be special 
under the Nazarite vow. It's going to be like others who've been born through the years, called out at birth. And even though it's just you and Elizabeth and you've been serving me so well, because of what you do and because of the birth of this child, the world will be different because I'm ordaining this in your lives. Zechariah asked the angel after he heard all of this, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. That's the part he did not tell his wife when he got home. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until this day happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Not punishment. There's a reason for this. Meanwhile, people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. They realized he'd had a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. You see, what was a small dream for them was a great plan for God. And that's where we see hope in all of this. The hope that the people have had of a Messiah coming needed this link right here for this Messiah to be ushered in, introduced by one special child that Zachariah and Elizabeth would have. And it happened on a holy day in a holy place where God spoke to him. But Zechariah got all nervous, all excited, all distracted in a way. And God brought him back to where he needed to be, even as he will us. You know, you know how much my university means to me and how... I have been a part of Mercer for a long time. Not only did I go there, my dad went there, and my son went there, and lots of others have gone there as a part of, of my life as well. When I was there in the 70s, I remember one thing vividly, and that was that twice a year, the campus went into a uh, stepped-up mode in some way or another, you know. The um, curbs around the parking lots were painted fresh. The door that goes, went to the uh, post office where everybody would kick the doors, they'd go in just to get it open, it was all scratched up, was always given a fresh coat of paint. The student center floors were waxed, made special. Fresh flowers were put in the Connell Student Center. And we knew it was time for the trustees to meet. Little orange cones were put out for them to have their special parking places. Uh, smells waft from the kitchen that never waft from the kitchen when the students were there. Everything was buffed up and made pretty and everybody seemed to be in a whole different mood. A little bit more on guard because the trustees were coming to campus. And I used to see that and I was kind of awed by that and I thought, man... If someday I could just be on the trustees there, that would be so cool because it seemed like the highest honor of anything that could ever happen. Well, fast forward years later to uh, when I was a good bit older than I was when I was in college, almost twice my age. I um, got a phone call one day from the president of the university saying, we're nominating you to be on the trustees. And I thought, that is so cool. Um, in fact, I think my conversation with him was, with the president of the university, was something like, wow, are you serious? Sure. I, and then I said, I mean, I would be honored to be a part of that. <laughs> I'm sure my voice cracked and I almost hung up on him because I had to get off the phone and call Roxanne and say, let me tell you what's happened. It was a dream. It was something I'd hoped for. And it was coming true. 
Well, I got so excited about it, and later I got the formal letter that invited me to come and told me when it was and when there'd be orientation and all this other stuff that goes along with that. Well, when the letter came and I began to think about going to my first trustees meeting, my mind went back and I thought, the curbs are going to be painted and all the fresh coat of paint on there. There'll be fresh flowers there and food from upstairs. I get to see what really happens in that room up there. And I got to campus and I walked home, parked in one of the little orange cones was moved for me to park. And I walked into the student center where the dining room was where we met. And as I walked through, I met a couple of the professors I had known when I was on campus. You know, I was their student, now I was their trustee there. And as I walked in, they'd say, well, hey, Jimmy, what are you doing on campus? And I said, well, what I wanted to say was, I'm going to be here for me, the meeting. I'm a trustee now, but I didn't do that. I said, I'm here for a meeting. And they said, well, have a great meeting. And so I went on. And I walked upstairs, and I got ready to walk in. I opened the door, and the room was empty. I was there an hour and a half early for the meeting. <laughs> I hadn't slept much the night before. I'd gotten so excited about it. And so I was there, and I thought, well, what do I do now? How do I not look like a total dork having gotten here an hour and a half early, maybe over-anxious that way? And as I did, I was kind of, you know, moving around. I looked, and I saw that I had gotten dressed so quickly I'd forgotten my belt that morning. And uh, I also looked down and saw I had put on a brown shoe and a black shoe. I kept them in the closet. When I dressed, I just stuck my feet in and grabbed two of the shoes. And I usually wore loafers, so they were brown and black. So here I am on my first day as a trustee, my aspirational moment. And all of a sudden, I look down without a belt and with a brown shoe and a black shoe. And I'm supposed to have the prayer before the meal because they do that when you're a preacher and you go on for the first time. And they had asked me to do it. And I almost fell apart. I thought, this is horrible. They're going to see I'm an imposter. I knew I shouldn't have been here in the first place. I didn't deserve this. This is too big a thing for me. And now I can't even dress right and I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be humiliated in front of everybody. Well, I stopped for a minute and I kind of found a corner and I sat down and I got quiet. And I began to reason through that moment. I thought, you know, if I button my coat, nobody sees whether I'm wearing a belt or not. See, you can't tell. I am, but you can't tell. <laughs> most of us, most of the time, would be sitting at tables. And so our feet were under the table, so they weren't going to see that. And when I stood up to have the prayer, they had to have their eyes closed during the prayer so they couldn't see my brown shoe and my black shoe. And I didn't realize it either that we kind of look at each other. We always were looking at each other and not really looking at people's shoes. And bless his heart, Tom Black was there and he took me under his wing and he just took care of me through the whole thing. That's when he and I deepened our friendship during those days. But it was that quiet time, that time when I stopped and thought it through and reordered my mind. I had gone in there excited about what I was doing. And in those quieting moments, I had been so distracted, I'd made a bunch of mistakes. And in those quieting moments, I refocused and decided why I was there. Not what I was going to do, not what it meant to me or anything else, but what my purpose was. It refocused me. When I think about Zechariah, he was so excited about that moment and when the lots were cast and he was the one who was chosen, he was excited about that moment. I can't tell you whether he had on the same color sandals or whether he had on a sash. I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is when he went into that place and God began to work in his life and then God shows up and reveals himself through the angel Gabriel in the way that he did, answers his and Elizabeth's prayer, can you imagine the distraction of that moment? He was there not to learn that he's going to have a baby and that he and Elizabeth had their dreams to come true. He was there to change the lives of his people, to pray prayers of intercession that were powerful and important, that through the generations had been the prayers that the people had depended upon. He couldn't be distracted in this moment. Yet the angel had spoken to him, and his concern was, well, how can this be? I'm old, she's old, how can this be? 
And the angel looked at him and he said, I'm going to put you in time out. If I don't do that, you're going to keep talking about how can this be and I'm not sure about this and I'm old and how do these things happen. I'm going to give you quiet time. And if you listen to the passage, what happened was the angel said you won't speak. You won't be able to talk until the promise is fulfilled and the baby is born. The power of silence there is the power that Zechariah needed in his life. The angel's message was something like this. Peace be unto you. Do not be afraid. This is not a threat. It's a blessing. The focus is upon God doing something good here. Your prayers have been heard. What prayers? Prayers for the Messiah. And prayers for a child in your own home. And God is going to take both of those prayers and bring them together and do the greater thing that He has been promising to do for generations. And He is inviting you into His plan. He is giving you an opportunity to offer yourself in rearing a child that will announce the coming of the Messiah. That's what's going to happen. It's something greater than you have even imagined in your own heart. Why has God chosen you to receive this revelation? Why is this prayer being answered? It's because God has called you out and you found favor in the eyes of God. So if you will just quiet down and quit asking the questions and let God do in your life what He chooses to do, and follow Him completely, God will accomplish more than you can imagine. The child will be given to you. The child will be raised in the Nazarite tradition. The child will minister in the spirit of the great Elijah and bring powerful messages to the people and reveal what God is doing. So I'm going to put you in time out. You will be quiet. You won't speak. You won't be distracted by words. But you will be put in a way to listen. To listen quietly and carefully to what the Spirit will say to you and Elizabeth as we prepare to do what God is doing next. Find your inner peace. Refocus your heart. And God will use you in a mighty way. As we're going into the season of Advent and preparing for Christmas and the celebration of the birth of Jesus, do not neglect the need for quiet refocusing. There are so many things that are going to distract every one of us. So many things that will take us away from the very focus that the season is supposed to have. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. We're talking about the promise of God fulfilled. We're talking about salvation coming to His people. We're talking about the example. We're talking about learning from Him. We're talking about being healed and taught and growing in Him. That's what we're being taught. But we can't learn if we're talking so we find that quiet place, like Habakkuk 2.20 says, The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Literally, the Lord was in His holy temple. Literally, Zechariah was called to be silent before Him and to realize what was going to happen and how it was going to affect humankind. To realize what he would be required to do in rearing this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to realize what this would mean of sacrifice and blessing within his own family, to realize that the reconnecting with God on this level, away from the idea of, well, we're over the hill, we'll just go through the rest of our lives, that God is doing something new in their lives. And to ponder the mystery of incarnation where God would come into this world and to ponder the wonder and love of God of God. It's that drawing aside and being quiet. 
regrouping. And then, going on with why you're there. My mother-in-law taught me this. She really did. We would always go uh, to their house and my parents' house on Christmas. And it was always interesting to me because there's always chaos in the house. People coming and some of them had pets and all sorts of other things were going on and there was always something going on. Children of all ages and noise and, and getting things on the table and getting ready for gifts and bringing gifts in and who's wrapping that one more gift so they run back to the room and close the door and wrap one more, you know, all of that stuff. And when the food was finally on the table and things began to calm down a little bit, I always noticed my mother-in-law disappeared. And I thought, well, she's just letting everybody else eat first. The old southern thing that the, the one who does the most work is the one who eats last for some reason or another. But she disappeared. And one day I followed her where she was. And she was sitting there and she says, I'm just getting things together. What she would do is do all the things she had to do. Then she would pull aside and in quiet regroup and reset and refocus and then she entered back in as a part of the family enjoying the rest of it not as the one getting everybody everything ready but as the one sharing in the experience what does that tell us about our christmas preparation that we learn at this point to regroup to refocus to get all the things done we have to and then back away and think again so we can enter back into the experience and be who we're supposed to be in Christ. There's an old story about a nurse. She was brand new to nursing and because of that she ended up having to work on Christmas Eve. And so she wasn't real happy about it but she went to the hospital to work and when she went in she looked up and this is the way she described the man that walked into the room where she happened to be. She said, I could see a gigantic, roly-poly, elderly gentleman with long curly hair all decked out in bright red plaid shirt tucked in haphazardly into baggy red trousers. The trousers appeared to be held up by, two, uh, by only two wide fire engine red suspenders that had long outlived their elasticity said the only missing thing was a beard. The Santa Claus facsimile, she said, was standing in the doorway waiting patiently for an answer to the question he'd ask. The question? Missy, can I get you something from the cafeteria? He had just appeared there. And so then she watched, and he was just going from here to there and helping this person, doing that person, the other. And so she sat down with one of the other nurses, and she asked about him, and she said... Who is this character? And the other person said, let me tell you. His name is George. And said, I'll tell you what he, where he came into our lives. Said his wife was here years ago and said she was having a horrible time. She was dying, had been, here, had been dying for months, was in extraordinary pain. It was one of those situations where she just could not finish out life but said he was there faithfully, took care of her, loved her, cared for her in every possible way. And said he would go in at night and we'd tuck her in and he'd pray with her. And said at other times she would get big doses of medicine, fall asleep, and while he was there, he'd just go around and visit all the other patients. And he'd go pick up this and help a nurse pick up something from the cafeteria, take care of something else, and just kind of immersed himself in all the things going on. And she said it finally got to the point that her pain was so great and she was begging to die. And it was Christmas Eve. And he went and he sat down next to her and he said he took her hand to pray that night like he always did. And they prayed together for God's mercy and peace. And then she looked up and she said, but what will you do if something happens to me? And he said, I tell you what, if God will grant our prayer and give you peace and get you out of this pain, I will every holiday come up here and continue to take care of other people. I'll have a purpose, and it'll be our purpose together. 
and she slipped away. And the nurse said, he's been here every year since then. And he always comes and he gives us peace and he gives us calm. He takes them into a place of reminding them why they're there. To take care of people. It's the resetting. It gets away from the job and gets into why they're there. As we enter into this season where we begin with hope and we go into peace and joy and love and all the other things that are a part of it, it would be really easy to lose focus and to ask God more questions than listen for His guidance. May God give you hope. And may you find that hope in quiet. And may you reset your hearts right now. Because if you do, Christmas will be the best blessing you've had in a long, long time. That's just the way God works. Your small hope to have just a good Christmas can turn into God's expansive dream to change your life and the lives around you. Let Him do it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Spirit of God, we pray for Your guidance and Your strength for your peace and your help. We pray that you'll lead us into the quiet so that we can fulfill the great dream that you have. This season isn't about gifts under a tree. It's about a Savior in a manger. It's not about just the logistics of getting everybody together. It's about saving a lost world. Help us never to lose that perspective. You can appear to us, and when you do, silence us enough so that we will listen to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our invitation hymn is hymn 87. The doors of the church are open to receive any who feel the Spirit speaking. If God's speaking to you, this is your moment as we stand together and as we sing. Listen to what the Spirit says to accept Him as Savior, to rededicate your life, to become a part of this church family, whatever it is. I'll meet you at the front as we stand. Thank you for being a part of worship today. Don't forget to pick up a copy of the Advent devotional book as you leave this morning. There's some at the front and some in the back. Uh, please pick those up as you get ready to go. Also, remember that next Sunday evening is our Keyboards at Christmas. Uh, a magnificent time. It'll have uh, four pianos and organ and two harps. Right, we're having harps this year as a part of they're not keyboards, but they're finger things. So we'll, you'll have a chance to, to hear that next week. Uh, I hope you'll be a part of that too. You know, this is when we begin Advent by thinking about hope. I hope that this week you'll figure out what you hope to gain or hope to experience through this Christmas experience. What is it you hope for for Christmas? And as you go from this place... Find God's peace, find his help, find his strength, and fulfill that hope as much as you can, resetting your heart and preparing for what God will do next. In the name of our Lord and Savior, 
Amen. Thank you.